People ask me all the time, the transit in my city is bad or lacking. How do I make it better? And so in this video, I'm going to tell you how I would approach improving any transit network, even if you don't actually have one yet. If you're not already, consider supporting RM Transit and myself because I'm Arm Transit, on Patreon to help me bring you more important content like this, as well as early access to videos and even more. Thanks. In the years since I started the channel, people have frequently asked, it's really cool to hear about great transit networks around the world, but transit in my city isn't very good or doesn't exist. What should I do? What steps do I take to help create a good transit network? And that's what today's video is about. Uh, to be clear, there could be many parts in a certain video series about how to get good transit in your city because it isn't a single faceted thing. Today I'm going to talk about the transit planning, engineering side, but there's also stuff to be talked about with regards to advocacy and politics as well. Today's video is very much about planning and service design, as you'd probably expect from RM Transit. What transit services should I run to help establish a successful, lasting transit network in any city? The first stage is having transit, and it's a real problem for places around the world, especially more remote places or smaller cities, where establishing basic services like running water and electricity usually comes before running transit. So how should transit get started? When you have no transit, the first thing I would do is establish a minimum viable service sort of like a minimum viable product. Such a service is probably going to run with some sort of bus, be it big or small, and it's likely to operate as more of a circulator in a more circle-shaped urban area or as a linear corridor in a more linear-shaped urban area, allowing a single route and probably a small number of vehicles to provide a sizable amount of coverage and some good service. Frequencies are probably not going to be a priority at this point because people need basic access to transit before they can actually ride it or even care how frequent it is. The focus should probably be on covering major demand drivers like dense areas of residences and dense areas of commercial activity where jobs are located. Now, having a bus circulate or come by every hour isn't ideal, but with good planning, it can be consistent, and this allows people to plan their schedules around it, which makes that one hour frequency a little more bearable. Now, once your basic system is established, the next thing to probably invest in is coverage. Now, there's no easy answer for how much coverage you should have. That's really going to depend, like a lot of things, on your specific town or city. Counterintuitively, networks in the smallest towns and urban areas can often reach much further from the center, if you can define that, because there tends to be less congestion, which means that average vehicle speeds are higher. This is something you have to counteract with higher order modes as you develop. Extending service should usually happen when there's a medium term prospect of decent ridership returns. There's nothing wrong with investing early in a newly developing area if you think you'll get substantial amounts of riders because this can help establish stronger habits that will create far more riders from a given residential area in the future as people build their schedules and habits around using your transit service as long as it's convenient and takes them where they need to go. Extensions into more stagnant or extremely low density rural areas should be more conservative. At the end of the day, it's also important to remember that there isn't a one size fits all transit service for everyone. Some areas might want express services and some areas might want services to different locations than other areas, maybe because of employment patterns. So just because you have a bus that touches a neighborhood and it doesn't do very well, doesn't mean that that neighborhood doesn't want transit. It just might want different transit than what you're offering. Now, once you have a basic network established with some basic routes and riders, you need to start thinking about where you're going to target further investment. Circulator routes should start to be reduced and turned into more linear routes. This trades off coverage for service quality. Transfers between routes should probably happen in as few places as possible, and they should be timed for maximum convenience. Uh, that's called clock face scheduling, and if you want a video on it, you know what to do in the comments. If you're wondering why minimizing the number of transfer points is important, that really has to do with improving connectivity. It also means that if you're going to invest in little terminals or the like, more routes can share those amenities. It's also important because when routes overlap less, you're spreading your service probably more evenly. Overall, your network should really be focused on consistency, as I mentioned above. Even infrequent services can be useful as long as they are on time consistently. That way people can plan their trips based on a schedule. 
As your network continues to grow, you'll eventually need to make the transition to focusing on frequency over coverage. This should happen as returns from extending service further and further begin to diminish. I recommend investing in frequency in a sort of hierarchical fashion, and I sort of advocate for investing in transit in a bit of a hierarchical fashion. Your busiest routes should probably get like half of your investment in terms of service hours and capital dollars. But again, this is all dependent on your urban area. As you look through your list of routes, as routes become less and less used, they should get proportionally less funding for increased service hours. The reason I advocate for this sort of approach is that it tends to be easier to plan for and serve an area with a hierarchical structure in terms of what routes are the most used and the least used. If every route has similar ridership, you can't make bigger investments on the main routes that help centralize demand and further increase the popularity of those routes, making everything way more difficult. I think spreading yourself too thin with too many routes at too low of frequencies is a big mistake. It seems initially to be more equitable and better overall because more people can potentially access transit. But if less people are using transit, then your transit network suffers. And when your transit network suffers, less people get transit overall. Basically, you need to have some popular transit routes if you want to be able to operate routes that have to run at a loss for basic coverage. To help you use resources efficiently, consider remodeling your network as frequency increases. If parts of frequent routes are underperforming, consider cutting portions off and running them as branches. This helps keep the core area of your route short, which helps you better utilize your fleet, since shorter routes demand less vehicles for the same given frequency. As your frequency starts to reach a minimum of every 10 to 15 minutes on average, start considering reconfiguring your network to be more transfer-based. This allows you to shorten your most used routes and again reinvest into more frequency. At some point, your transit network is likely to become stable, with some number of routes, ridership that tracks with population growth and service, and a generally well-established network. At this point, I think you should start looking into maintaining your network rather than just establishing it. What I mean here is that your fundamental planning doctrine should move away from just trying to aggressively pick up new riders to trying to keep your existing riders. Once your network is fairly sizable, you need to remember that your ridership is based on the service you provide. And so making radical changes to your service needs to be something you're careful about since people chose to use transit for a reason. Spending should also reflect this change in approach. Funding, both operating and capital, should be put towards measures which reduce your operating cost of service. This makes you more resilient to things like budget cuts and force majeure events. Such investments can include things like a younger, lower maintenance fleet, infrastructure which lets vehicles travel faster, providing more service for a given amount of operator time and more fuel efficiency, and the like. Almost every measure that helps reduce operating costs in the long term also helps improve the quality of life for riders. Who doesn't like a newer bus or a faster trip? These two things are really positive and they can come together. Investing in keeping your transit system operating at a basic level no matter what happens is critical to helping people get to a place where they can actually depend on your network. And it helps you avoid ridership death spirals where you cut service and ridership decreases so you need to cut service even further. At the same time, some money should always be spent on speculative service expansion, especially if your city is growing. Testing the waters to see what new services might catch on. It's amazing how much cities change over time, so just because a route wasn't popular 10 years ago doesn't mean re-establishing it and trying again is a bad idea. I'm also going to make a video about that in the future, so stay tuned and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. A small amount of funding can also be spent on pure quality of life things, things like nicer shelters and onboard Wi-Fi. But you really shouldn't focus too much on these things because they rarely convert people to transit use alone. People come for good service, and while they'll probably appreciate free Wi-Fi and better shelters, at the end of the day they won't come at all if you don't have that basic service. It's also worth noting that if you have a high-performing transit network with a lot of riders, a lot of these quality of life things can be done for very low cost as part of an advertising partnership. For example, often advertisers, at least in North America, will pay for your bus shelters. It's also possible to do a sponsored ad-based Wi-Fi service, which can reduce costs on the transit operator, allowing you to invest in your bread and butter. More frequency and more service. Now, where you go from here is really conditional. Some systems won't really need additional capacity or coverage anytime soon. If you have a large city with little service or a fast growing city though, you need to start thinking about how you can scale up. You'll need to invest more substantially in service expansion and higher order modes to allow for more capacity and faster trips. 
Slower growing urban areas can focus more on resiliency and maintaining their networks, as well as improving quality of life and investing in reducing operating costs. A half step forward, which can be taken by almost any network when it gets to a certain size, is introducing some basic express bus services, often with articulated buses, which can carry more passengers than a standard 40 foot or 12 meter bus. Such services can effectively double up your corridor capacity and they don't require a ton more capital investment. In exchange though, they do cost a lot to operate, since you need to put a driver in every single bus. Now before I discuss rail, which I know a lot of you are waiting for, I want to address one of the most common questions people ask, what to spend new capital dollars on. New governments often get elected and offer things like tons of funding for public transit, but spending it in the right way is the difference between having a really pretty network with poor service and a more established network that provides a consistent high quality service for years to come. The easy and risky move would be to just immediately use capital funding to start building higher order modes. But there's something you have to consider. You must make investments based on what you can afford. Many cities, particularly in North America, clearly have poorly optimized transit infrastructure. And you can see this when you have higher order modes like electrified rail that are operated with large trains at very low frequencies. This is a very inefficient way of operating because you had to spend all of the capital money to build the network and now you have to spend a lot of money to maintain a large network with larger trains and more trackage to maintain a low frequency service. Of course, different types of rail can attract new riders, but unless you're building something like a metro or regional rail, you're really just building a bigger, higher quality bus, and you can provide the same kind of service as most light rail lines with buses. So investing in trams or light rail should probably only happen when it means reducing your operating costs, allowing you to provide more service per dollar than you could with buses. If your operational expenses are limited, you're probably better off operating a lot of slow transit rather than a little fast transit, since fast transit is rarely fast enough to compensate for less frequency. Part of this is a psychological effect where people feel like when they're sitting around waiting for transit, they're wasting a lot of time, versus time spent actually on a vehicle where people feel like they're at least moving somewhere. At the end of the day, if you're going to build expensive new infrastructure, you have to be sure that you're either going to attract new riders to help pay for it, or that you have new revenue streams that can again help you pay to operate that infrastructure. All that said though, new revenue streams don't necessarily need to go entirely to new service. I'd argue that just as with capital funding, you want to spend some money on improving the resiliency of your network, you can do the same with operating funding, maybe just to a lesser extent. For example, hiring more people to maintain your vehicles, to do more preventative maintenance so your vehicles last longer and are more reliable, providing a lot of value for money. Now when the time comes to invest in major, heavier transit infrastructure, everything becomes much more location dependent. If you have a disused corridor, which can be used affordably to spin up a new rail service, it's very different than if you have no such corridor. If you want to hear more about disused corridors and rail service, watch my video from Wednesday. Generally, I think the best approach to take is to invest in converting your highest ridership routes into modes which cost less to operate continually. If you're a small region, or if you've already dealt with all of your higher order lines, the best thing to do is probably to invest in battery electric or trolley buses. Electric buses in general are a good way of reducing operating expenses. They're simpler than diesel buses, which means they require less maintenance and can last longer. With electric buses, you're essentially trading some capital funding for less operating funding, which is a powerful tool. That said, electric buses for the average rider aren't gonna make a huge difference over regular buses, especially if you have hybrids already. So electric buses are unlikely to cause people to shift away from other modes, and they're not really gonna massively enhance capacity either. If you're similarly small, but with more density, trams or light rail can be a decent consideration. Much like with electric and trolley buses, they further reduce the cost to move each passenger. Just remember that with any kind of service where you have to install heavy infrastructure like electric wires or rails, you don't want an orphan service. So if only a five stop portion of your busiest bus route actually justifies tram service, it probably makes sense to eat it and just run a few more buses for that rather than to invest in the new maintainers and vehicle fleet required for something like trolleys or a tram line. Larger modes are good if you're hedging on major ridership expansion. That can either be from more compelling service or service to new areas, thanks to faster travel times, or from serving latent demand, where routes were entirely full and you're freeing up capacity. That said, rail investments, especially heavier forms of rail, metros and regional rail, need to be made extremely carefully. 
Rail is a large investment, and if you make a mistake with it, it can completely destroy your transit system, sucking up a ton of operating funding, causing you to cut service on other routes, and leading to a ridership death spiral, which is really not what we want. So yeah, that's pretty much the approach I would take. Step by step, from a non-existent transit system to one where rail is something you're investing in. These steps are likely to get refined in the future in more developed videos where I go into more detail and talk about more edge cases, but for a first try, I'm curious to know what you think, so leave a comment down below. I think these are good guidelines for establishing an attractive and resilient transit network in any city though. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again tomorrow.